Welcome to the fifth variation in language talk from the Department of Linguistics and English Language at Lancaster University. I'm Julia Gillen and I'm talking today about writing the Edwardian postcard, formality, informality and multimodality. I'm going to introduce you to literacy studies and then my main talk is about the Edwardian postcard, the social media of the 20th century, the early 20th century that is. I'll be talking about the history of the early postcard, the Edwardian picture postcard in particular, and my research, including research questions, illustrative findings, and give you a flavour of corpus linguistics analysis. I'll be offering three conclusions and then suggesting that you can email me if, we, if you have any questions. On the right is a drawing of the picture postcard craze as it began in Berlin. You can see two fashionable ladies on the right selecting postcards from the, from the postal worker's uh, box. You can see the lady at the bottom left writing a postcard and the standing one is posting a postcard. It's very indicative of a craze, fashionable ladies in the park enjoying a new pastime. So first of all, I want to introduce you to literacy studies. Why is this series called Speaking of Language Variation? Well, the main reason is that I'm speaking this talk and not writing it to you. But this issue brings about a key contemporary challenge for linguistics and gives us a role in literacy studies and in researching social media. Traditionally, many linguists have only been interested in spoken language. So in this very recent textbook, for example, Research Methods in Linguistics, it only assumes that linguistics is interested in spoken language. The only chapter about written language is used to shed light on how people spoke in the past. I would say this attitude to linguistics, this definition of its scope, if you like, is fairly rare nowadays, but it's still, as you can see, considered mainstream by some. Assumptions made about spoken and written language are quite often simplistic. So David Crystal, for example, an early researcher in internet linguistics and very impressive, started off working with the assumption that spoken language tends to be informal and written language formal, and so developed such a con concept as NetSpeak, for example. But actually, if we really think about how we use language in everyday life, we can see that these two dichotomies are not necessarily the case. We can speak formally in, for example, speeches, announcements, sermons and so forth. We can write informally, whether on post-it notes or in social media, perhaps. Literacy studies, then, take seriously languages as materialised in mediated forms, such as prints and screens. We're concerned with reading and writing practices wherever they occur, and so we're interested in literacy as social practice and language as multimodal. So much of my research is concerned with social media, for example, which typically has complex combinations of texts and images. Now, we'll go back then to the uh, late 19th century and the advent of the postcard. And the first postcards were very drab objects like this one here. So, you could only write the name and the address on that side and then put a short message in the other. But as you can perhaps see from these statistics, nevertheless, the early postcard was enormously popular. Why do you think that was so? Well, it was because of what else was around at the time. The alternative that people had been using was the letter. You were taught at school how to write letters. There were strict things to be said about layout and what was included. So it was something of a labour sometimes. It's most small, small wonder then that the postcard was tremendously popular. The Times in 1896 suggested, now the postcard is the letter of the poor. It was cheaper to send than a letter, and you could just write a short message. But actually, even at that time, they were mistaken, because in fact, the postcard had been taken up by all sectors of society. What was going on then at the beginning of the 20th century, the period that I'm researching? Well, there were great changes in the first decade of the 20th century, which is normally known as the Edwardian age, after the name of the King Edward VII, then there were tremendous changes in society. There was a growth of the middle classes and increased leisure time, a huge amount of cheap and efficient travel. In 1909, the railway was at its zenith, increased women's rights and an increase in schooling and literacy levels so that the postcard was accessible to all. You can almost feel the excitement of this postcard writer saying I'm writing this on the sands when he's visiting Blackpool. Other changes, the first one, efficient postal services. So in the UK, there were up to 10 deliveries a day in London. If you were living in a town, you might have several deliveries. 
even rural, you might perhaps get two deliveries a day. So that you could possibly have a postcard land on your door, doormat between 6am and 10pm. So they're extremely fast and that was what, what makes them rather similar to social media today, one big factor. Uh, colour was beginning to be introduced and although there, there wasn't yet colour photography, you can see that there were some techniques used to make rather beautiful cards such as the one on the left, which is relatively expensive, it's true, but at least was a possible technology. Paper was much cheaper and so many companies entered the postcard market um, offering many different uh, many different uh, uh, genres, um, everything from the cute babies you see at the top to cute cats, celebrities and so forth. So a great change then was with the advent of pictorial postcards, which was from 1894 and caused another um, great surge of popularity. So we have this card sent by David Evans to his sister, Miss Mary Evans, who lived in Camberwell, London. David was a student in Oxford and he's sending this card just very briefly when he was in Reading Station. So at this time, the whole of one card was the whole of one card was taken up by the message and the other was a combination of picture and short message, which again reminds me somewhat of so, certain social media platforms. However, from 1802, we have the divided back, which is something like a more familiar form of postcard. So the whole of one side was taken up by the picture and the other was divided between the name and address and uh, the writing. Um, in this case, this card going to Mrs. Hardley, you can see that the writer has actually done what we call cross hatching, which is writing in two directions. And we'll come back to that later. So the reign of Edward VII, 1901 to 1910, a period of great change, coincided with the golden age of the picture postcard. And we've used the Postmaster General's reports and calculated that the total posting of cards during his reign was just about 6 billion cards, about 200 per person. And if you think of all the people that couldn't write cards, the very young, the very old, the underclass and so forth, then it really is evidence of the post picture postcard as a tremendously popular phenomenon in society. At the time, people were conscious that it was a time of great technical innovation. This is one of my favourite cartoons from the time, from the magazine Punch. So in the picture at the top, from 19, you know, representing 1900 from the standpoint of 1910, you can see the sense that there was this new, startlingly new technology just starting to appear on the roads, the motor car. However, the car has broken down and so the familiar horse has been pressed into service to carry, draw it along. In the second picture, the roads have been much improved, the horse has been relegated to the field, but this time the new technology coming along is the aeroplane, but it's broken down and so the now relatively reliable car is pu pulling it along. And Kress, Gunter Kress in 1998, wrote about how the advent of the digital revolution was really changing um, communications beyond belief and wrote of the new communications landscape. And I think there's a parallel to be drawn between the advent of digital communications and the situation of 1900 to 1910 approximately. So here's a sample card view, and uh, this shows uh, almost certainly this will be the three people who lived in the house who have then issued the postcard. One used to get travelling photographers uh, knock at the door and say, you know, would you like me to make a postcard of you and your house? Um, and then you'd perhaps buy a pack of 200 or something and then send them to everybody. So I think these people have probably done that. It's a kind of equivalent of the uh, the selfie now. And what we've got here is um, is then is a, a rapidly written text, and it shows you something about the rapidity of the cards, how quick they could get through, because the text says, "Dear Mother, just a line to tell you if George is not coming today, our George will come and fetch the peelings and bring you a bit of pork. So don't get any meat. Hoping you are well, all well, Mother. Kiss, kiss, kiss to Doris." So we can see that the message is about something that's happening later that day. So what we would use perhaps a text message for now or any kind of message. It's about something that will happen in the next few hours. This card is unusual, actually, in that there are some misspellings. Uh, we find, you know, generally spellings very standard. But of course, the writer's writing with great confidence and gets the message, gets the message across very well. Regarding the kiss, kiss, kiss to Doris, I kind of wonder if it was a little child at home and it's the little child that's done the scribbles on the card. But obviously, one we'll never know that. 
Here's actually my favourite card, um, partly perhaps because I was born in Brighton. So the front of the card with the picture says the men are very domesticated at Brighton and somebody's added example Arthur. And you can see here actually that the postcard manufacturer has differentiated the card according to where, where they're sending it. So they've probably got the men are very domesticated at Plymouth, South End, wherever. And this particular batch for selling at Brighton, they've written at Brighton. And the writer has added something in there. On the other side, you can see that they've written in all sorts of different directions and used the space rather freely. And this makes me think when I'm comparing it with uh, today's social media, that in some ways there is more freedom sometimes in the sense of orientation, um, showing your own handwriting and so forth. Of course, what there is very limited compared to today is the sense of audience. So this card says, Dear, dear Ethel, you mean bounder not to write. Very sad occurrence in Brighton Saturday. You'll be grieved to hear it. I stood on one groin, that's a breakwater, and my hat, four and a half pence, flew off into the sea. I don't believe I shall ever see it again. And then written above that text, Arthur arose at 6am this morning, very energetic, isn't he? So I feel that first of all, the writer has written to Ethel, told a little funny story. Then they've done something to engage with the picture on the other side. You'll remember the mention of Arthur there. And so that's the kind of multimodality of it. The connection of the message, that part of the message with the other side. And then written up across the top of the card, perhaps as an afterthought, important bit of information, mother arrived safely, we all met her. So we can see that this card has been used to carry out quite a few different functions and will probably be um, welcomed by the uh, person who receives it. So in the project, um, in the main collection of cards, I've collected 3,000 cards written and posted between 1901 and 1910 in Great Britain and Ireland. The picture on the left shows a postcard fair, which is one of the venues at which it's possible to buy postcards. So to describe my data organisation and approach to analysis, first of all, I transcribe the cards, uh, obviously preserving orthography and preserving line endings. With a database, I categorise the cards, um, broadly create categories for the images, the writing instruments used, the language, the presence of any particular code, such as shorthand or other specific codes to postcards, categorise them according to their legibility, the main layout or orientation of writing, um, other, other factors such as the um, distance um, of every 10. I'm interested in gender, who sent the cards, so gender of sender, gender of addressee, if that's possible. We then um, Use the historical records as well, the census records of 1901, 1911, and sometimes earlier, in order to find out more about the card senders and receivers. Occasionally, we access births, marriages and deaths registers, use Google Earth, maps and so on. And occasionally, there are other informants that are made use of, including Picture Postcard Monthly, where I used to write a column, and social media channels. I also use corpus linguistics. You may have encountered corpus linguistics if you, for example, listen to other talks in this series. So essentially what that means is that I combine the 3000 texts, take out the names and addresses and look at the look at the texts. So combine them into one database and then, sorry, one text, one corpus, I meant to say. And then we can use other tools as well, such as corpus assisted, computer assisted qualitative data analysis and spatial analyses for particular purposes. So I'll come that, back to that later. So my research questions for the project are, who used picture postcards to communicate with their social networks? Was it men? Was it women? Were they young, old? What kind of occupations and so forth? How did people make use of the speed of the cards across time and distance? As we've seen, they could arrive very quickly. Three, in what ways did postcard writers make use of the new multimodal opportunities? So in order to give you a flavour of where I'm going, I'll be talking about a, just a few cards in this respect. So here's a card that was sent to Miss Janet Carmichael, who was 23 in 1911 in the census. Um, so a very young woman, this was sent. There's a few interesting things about this card. The first is, that Janet Carmichael, who lived in Buxton, was not at home when she received this card. 
and this card is just one of many illustrations that the Edwardians carried on receiving cards as well as sending them wherever they went. Rather as today we use social media, we certainly don't stop use it, using it when we travel. So Janet Carmichael was not just sending cards in Lockerbie, but also receiving them. This particular one just has a very short message. Hope to see you this evening, love Nessie. So that showed that Nessie was very confident that uh, Janet would receive the card within a few hours as it concerned a message for that about that day. Here's another card in the collection of Janet Carmichael. And this is from a friend that she had since early childhood, Dora, who lived in Stretford. Janet Carmichael had been born in, indeed in Stretford in Manchester, the daughter of a Scottish surgeon. Um, but when she was three, her father had died. And so she and her mother had moved initially with the grandmother and then into a house in Buxton, which is where she's receiving this card. And what the girls are doing here, uh, Janet and her friend Dora, is discussing popular culture. Um, they're discussing a book by Dumas, The, the Three Musketeers. Um, and the picture postcard shows a representation of one of the characters from the novel. Uh, the, the, the picture postcards were so common in every genre that it was quite typical for cards to be exchanged that referred to popular culture or indeed to any other kind of aspect of culture in that way. You could find bishops, actresses, cricketers, any kind of star of the day. So here, Dora seems to rather misunderstand what the Three Musketeers means. Her message says, what do you think of this? And did you ever see anything so silly? Just try to imagine Athos dressed like that. It is impossible. And it never mentioned they're having guns, did it? So it's rather amusing that she's mis mis mistaken um, what a musketeer might mean. But you get the point that they're discussing. Um... So I'm going to return to that very first card I sh showed you to Mrs Hardley. And it was written by George Hardley, and we have managed to transcribe it as, as follows. So it's from the Puffin, which was a boat, on the North Dock of Swansea in 1909. And George writes, My dear wife, Lawrence and I were walking up the main street this evening at 4.45, when we came face to face with George. It was a great surprise to all of us. We returned at once to the Puffin, so we are now going to have tea. I shall persuade him to stay here tonight. It seems like old times in being here again tonight. True love to you and all at home, always yours, George. So you can see that George has managed to fit in quite a long message to his wife there. George and his wife had 10 children uh, between them. Um, at this stage, uh, Father George was about 45 and Lawrence and George, son George, were his two oldest sons. So um, it's, it's very nice that the first thing that when Father George and Lawrence met son George, the first thing that they thought to do was to send a postcard to the mother to tell them about it. And through investigations, we've indeed been able to find that this is probably the puffing um, taking coal uh, around the coast. So, obviously that this, this research project is taking quite a long time, but we can already certainly say who used picture postcards to communicate with their social networks? Almost everyone. We've got a card to Lloyd George's daughter. We've got a card to um, the daughter of a tin miner in a hamlet in Cornwall. People across society, with the only exception of the underclass, the homeless, the extremely poor and destitute, um, used cards. How did people make use of the speed of cards across time and distance? They kept in near constant touch. There's so many uh, references to kind of sending, just having received a card, sent a card, receiving a letter and so forth. Um, so they, they, as I said, as Janet's card showed, they're sending and receiving cards while they're traveling. In what ways did postcard writers make use of the new multimodal opportunities? Well, they used cards to share and collect images that they were keen on. They selected, commissioned and crafted images on cards. We had that kind of similarity to the selfie. We've had people also drawing on their own cards and making various creative uses of opportunities offered by both sides of the card in terms of space and so forth. So all in all, in literacy, in terms of literacy, we'd say that this is a vernacular literacy, essentially not regulated by the formal rules and procedures of dominant social institutions, such as schools, and which has its origins in everyday life. Now, if I were to investigate to what extent is the language of postcard users formal or informal, 
it would therefore be very, very complex. It certainly wouldn't be as simple as considering, you know, is it spoken or is it written language? Um, in Biber's landmark publication, he suggested there are six dimensions of linguistic features to, 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 to look at. Um, and also further to those uh, six, six types of linguistic features, also situational, communicative and processing characteristics. So obviously that's an extremely complex exercise and uh, not what, one which I'll be uh, trying to do today. So what I will do is to just give you a flavour of corpus linguistics analysis. So taking an exploratory approach to that corpus I talked about, where we put the text of all 3,000 cards together. So what I did here was to compare that corpus with another corpus of British English. I used a kind of mid 20th century corpus to compare it with. And so keywords is looking not simply at how frequent is a word in the corpus, but how frequent is it in comparison. So you can see, for example, that um, you, dear, I, love, they're the four, four words in the Edwardian postcard corpus that strike out as particularly frequent in comparison to what we might call a corpus of English as a whole. Of course, no corpus can be quite that because there are such questions of representation, but you probably get the idea. So there's some things I'm quite interested in there. We could look, for example, at it, it obviously a very dialogic genre with a you and I. We could consider perhaps dear and love or looking further down, thanks. So let's take a, just a few examples then of things that could be explored. Could dear and love be indications of romance? Well, let's. I looked first at dear, found it was most often at the beginning, sometimes preceded by a date or a place name, or my dear, or my dear sister. And they all, all of the indicate, all of the instances of dear that were at the beginning fell into that pattern, with the one exception of my dear little snowdrop. So we can see really that what's happening here is bringing over the use of the word dear from a letter writing convention where it's often used at the beginning. In the middle of the letter, however, sorry, in the middle of the postcard, it's more often used as a term of endearment, as a kind of affectionate term. So we've got some examples here. Do not be late, dear, for we shall have, and so forth. Um, so, so it's used more as a term of affection if it's in the middle of the letter, or very occasionally it came close to the end, such as that penultimate example, thanking you all the same, dear, with best love. We can also look at such keywords, we can look at them in context. So in other words, we get a brief glimpse of the instance of um, love from where it appears. So here, for example, I've looked at keywords in context for love to see, you know, we can just glance down it. Do we get a flavour of romance or do we not? And I'd say probably we don't. We get indeed more of a kind of letter writing flavour, often coming at the end, or at least in that kind of love to all from Minnie and so forth. So it's just another way of getting a quick glimpse of what a keyword's doing. We can also look at clusters. What clusters of love appear? And the most frequent one is love to, the next one is love from. And we can see again that there's this pattern of drawing it from a sort of letter writing practice, but perhaps um, with, with some affection rather than a romantic connotation. So I mentioned the word thank that appeared quite high and I wondered what were the postcard writers thanking their addressees for? And here are the, here are the uh, collocates. And we've got the first noun to appear, if you like, is letter. We've got card a bit further down, various other kind of short words. The P, by the way, is an abbreviation for postcard, PPC. That would be that sort of thing. So we've got a quite high association with letters and cards there in terms of what they're thanking their addressees for. So a key finding then, I'd say from that brief exploratory um, exercise, is the relationship of the postcard to the letter is strong. Some people do draw on letter writing practices in writing postcards. People often mention letters in their postcards. And people communicate constantly, often sending postcards in between letters. Letters are longer and more private, but the image on the postcard means it's a kind of gift. So my first conclusion then would be to do with parallels with today's social media. I'd say it was a novel communications technology experienced by its users as near synchronous because of the rapidity with which they appeared. 
there were new multimodal affordances. People enjoyed um, interacting, as it were, creating or interacting or commissioning with the images. There were new concerns about public or private boundary issues. Uh, a postcard was held to be potentially libelous, unlike a, unlike a letter. So if, for example, you sent somebody um, a postcard insulting them, you could be prosecuted and sometimes people were. Whereas if you sent them a letter, it was a private communication and you could say what you like. There were also moral panics over literacy standards. You know, all these young people writing postcards, are they're not writing properly, that sort of thing. And concerns about vulgarity and even as to whether um, pornography was somehow being smuggled into the postcard industry. Second, I think I obviously find um, this an extremely interesting topic, partly because I think language could be particularly interesting in times of rapid change and technological innovation. So Blom, for example, writing of the Edwardian period, said then as now, rapid changes in technology, globalisation, communication technologies and changes in the social fabric, dominated conversations and newspaper articles. Then as now, cultures of mass consumption stamped their mark on the time. Then as now, the feeling of living in an accelerating world was overwhelming. And this made me think of um, one of the cards. It is quite amusing when you want to cross the road. There are so many motor buses and such like, but we shall have to get used to it. My third conclusion, a more general one for linguistics then, is that I think linguistics must put at the front of its concerns materiality and mode, all languages mediated, whether spoken or written. Therefore, we should always think about properties of language. How it how it's appears and avoids what I call the speech writing blur, which to, which confuses that. Multimodality is an important aspect of language in use, and so is key to the further development of linguistics. I'd be very happy to share, you know, further information or an article if you like. Um, there are my references. Um, I'd be happy if you emailed me or uh, contacted me to ask any further. And we have a project website, YouTube videos, Facebook and a Twitter account. Thank you very much.